the Bibles this evening, turn to Matthew chapter 28 with me, if you would, please. I told my wife when we came tonight, I had like five sermons on my heart. I only have about uh, 3,000 plus sermons that I've preached over the years, and so I always wrestle with what to preach. I think I probably read through about 10 of them today, and, uh, but this is a new one the Lord gave me for tonight, so um, I tried to get away from it, but he won't let me do that, so we're going to go there. It'll be very simple tonight. I don't think we'll be very, very long tonight, uh, but... Uh, one of the things I've said to you, you know, I'm an, I'm an evangelist, and, uh, and I pastored for 26 years, and I always felt that, well, I surrendered evangelist, I always felt when I became an evangelist, one of the things that I would do is I would try to stir churches up and help churches, and I would try to help pastors, because I always felt that I wish an evangelist would come in and help me with some of these issues. Now, there are some things that pastors can't say to their people, that's sad, but they can't say it to them. Because the people will think that they're that they're shooting that the preacher's shooting at them. Well, well, preacher knows what's going on in my life, so he's preaching at me. Can I tell you this? Ninety-nine point nine nine percent of preachers are never going to shoot at you or preach at you. Okay, they love you. Okay, and when they preach something, and I always say this: if the shoe fits, wear it. Amen. Instead of getting 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 mad, get glad, amen. Instead of getting bent out of shape, get right, amen. And so, and so, but and then when God gave me the, the opportunity to kind of interim this pastor, I feel like my job is to try to prepare us to be ready to go when we get a pastor, amen. And uh, so tonight's kind of one of those messages, just try to kind of prepare us to be ready to go when we get a pastor, whoever that is. So look at me in Matthew twenty-eight, verse eighteen is. No unfamiliar passage of Scripture. Very familiar. You can probably all quote it. Matthew 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Last uh, Sunday night, I preached on uh, how, to be, how to be a great church. Tonight, I want to preach on what God is looking for in a church. What God is looking for in a church. Right here in this passage of Scripture, I think I've, you, we find the four most important things that God is looking for in a church. When God looks down at Amazing Grace Baptist Church, I believe these are the four things that He's looking for. Number one, God is looking for a place where people are being born again. God is looking for a place where people are being born again. When's the last time we saw somebody saved here? When's the last time we saw somebody born again in a morning service? I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just saying to you, here's his commission. Go ye into all the world and teach. Uh, go, go, ye, go ye therefore and teach all nations. And that word teach there is a word which means to make disciples, to enroll as a student. It means to get people, tell them the gospel, teach them about their sin, teach them about consequences of sin, teach them about salvation through Christ, and get those people to, and, and, and you and I don't get them, amen, but we are to lead them to the place where they become disciples or followers of Christ, or they enroll, so to speak, into the Christian faith, amen? Uh, Matthew, Mark chapter 16 and 15 says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You see, God is looking for a place where people are being born again. Now, I want to say this to you as kindly as I can. The church is not a social club. Now, it's, 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 it, we should socialize in the church, and, and, and I think that my social life should be involved around the church. But God is looking for a church to be a place where people are being born again. People ought to be getting born again as a result of Amazing Grace Baptist Church. And how many people have been saved as a result of Amazing Grace Baptist Church in the last six months or a year? And that's what we need to have as a focus, that people come to know Christ as Savior. And that's why, of course, we need a pastor who's going to lead us to be soul winners, amen? Going to lead us to go out and reach them, go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. A pastor that's going to have us go out and reach people with, with tools that, that are they're not, the tools are not necessarily biblical, but they're used to bring people. You know, pastor has using a bus ministry. Well, the bus ministry is a lot of work, a lot of money, yes, but the bus ministry brings a lot of people to Jesus. 
Amen. And ministries bring a lot of people to Jesus. If you don't have ministries, people don't come. Sunday school brings a lot of people to the house of God. People need Sunday school. People want Sunday school. You know, when I was pastoring, uh, I, I felt very impo- strongly about Sunday school. And uh, there was two areas I felt very strongly about. Three areas, children and teenagers. But two areas I feel that most churches are failing in, college-age kids and young couples. They need a Sunday school ministry so that they can enroll and get in where they can find a place to be. Amen. And so we see the example of the apostles, the disciples, the early followers of Jesus and of Paul, and of the epistles' instructions to the church uh, that the believers who, who made up the body of Christ, we see that this is not something that should surprise us, that God is looking for a place where people are being born again. Amen. Are you with me on this? Amen. I mean, the church ought to be a place where people are being born again. That's the main purpose of the church, is to preach the gospel to a lost and dying world. The main purpose of the church is not for us to isolate ourselves and come in here and have a place of protection, though we, uh, I'm not against us having a place we can come to. Amen? God gave us that, but I hope you understand what I'm saying. Philippians chapter 1, uh, keep, your, keep your finger here in Matthew. We'll come back to Matthew 28 because all of the points come out of this passage. But go with me to Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 27, if you would, please. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27. If you take time to read the book of Acts, which I went through last week and will not do it again, but you'll find that they were everywhere preaching the gospel. You'll find that you look at the life of the apostle Paul that he said, I I am free from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. He said to a, a church at Ephesus leader, he said, I take your record for the space of three and a half years. I cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. God is looking for a place where people are being born again. Now listen to me. I, I know we're living in different times. I hear all that stuff. And, but you know what? There are still people that are lost. There are still people that are longing. There are still people that will you can lead to Christ. Amen. There are people we can get to church that will respond to the gospel. There, God is still in the soul-saving business. Amen. But the harvest is plenteous and the laborers are few. Amen. And God is looking for a place where people are being born. And I'll be honest with you. I don't want to be a part of church where people are not getting saved. I do not want to be a part of a dead church. To me, that's a dead church. When there are people not being saved, the church is dead or dying. And we uh, we have a great group of people, and we have a great church here, but we got to get back to the main business, amen? And I believe this. We need a leader. We need leadership. And I don't feel like I'm the leader because I'm just an interim. I'm getting on the road pretty soon. And that's why we desperately need a man of God to lead us to be a church where people are getting born again. Amen, amen, and amen. Look at verse Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come or see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. He's writing here to the church, not the preacher. And he says, I want to hear that you are striving together for the faith of the gospel. We should be co-laborers with Christ, amen? And we should be co-laborers in this matter of seeing people saved. So the first thing God's looking for in a church is a place where people are being, uh, being uh, born again. Number two, go back to Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19. And look at that next part there in verse number 19. It says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. What's the next thing? thing? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Ghost. So God is looking for a place where people are being baptized. He's looking at a place where people are being born again. He's looking for a place where people are being baptized. Now listen, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just trying to speak to you tonight from the heart. When's the last time we saw the baptismal water stir? I went to a church not long ago, and it really wasn't a church of my liking, but they started the service with a baptism. And I thought to myself, that ought to be going on at Amazing Grace Baptist Church. That ought to be going on at every church uh, that's preaching the gospel, that loves God and is on fire for God. I, I, we ought to be baptizing. You know, I, I, uh, years ago, Dr. Bob Gray at Longview used to just put a lot of emphasis on baptisms, and a lot of people got angry at him because they thought he was like making baptism salvation but no but really uh if you get somebody if somebody gets saved and they don't get baptized baptized what's that tell you about their christianity it doesn't tell you're not saved but it tells you they're probably not going anywhere 
Because the first act of obedience after salvation is baptism. When I was trained to be a soul winner, I was trained also to tell people that there's two things that God commanded us to continue to do, to baptize them and to teach them. As my responsibility to tell them how to go to heaven was also my responsibility to baptize them. It was also my responsibility to teach them how to go to heaven. I said, now, I can't do any of those things if you don't let me. You let me show you how to go to heaven. Now, will you let me baptize you? And I explained to them that baptism does not save you, but it is a work of righteousness. It is a testimony of our salvation. It is a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And it's a picture of what happens to me. I'm going to die. I'm going to be buried. And I'm going to raise again. Amen. It's identifying with Jesus. Jesus Christ, amen, and it's what God has commanded us and expects of you to do, and I worked very hard to get those people I led to Christ to let me get them to church so I could baptize them, and then I said the third thing God told me to do is to teach you, and I said to him, I can't do any of those things if you don't let me, but if you'll let me, I'll do all three of those things for you, amen, and God is looking for a church, he's looking for a church, what's he looking for a church? A place where people are being born again, and he's looking for a place where people are being baptized, Go with me to uh, uh, Acts chapter uh, 2 and verse 41. Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. And I just challenge you to study the word baptism. And notice that the first church in Acts was baptizing people all over. Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, we see this. And then they that gladly received his word were what? Baptized. And the same day there were added to them about what? 3,000 souls. So first of all, they received his word. You go to Acts chapter 8, you have Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch reading there the scriptures. Paul, uh, uh, Philip preaches unto him Jesus. He said, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? He said, if thou believest, thou mayest. So the prerequisite for baptism, you must be believed in Jesus Christ. Amen. And so then he baptized him. Amen. Uh, so baptism, go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. And I'm just telling you, dear friend, that there's a burning desire in my heart to see this church be in a place where people are being born again and to see this church be a place where people are being baptized again. Amen. And that's what this church needs to be praying for and seeking for, and that's what we need to be prepared to start doing. When God gives, gives us a man to leave, we need to be prepared to get out and go soul winning. We need to be prepared to bring them in. Amen. You know, and, and I used to say this to my church people, your, your, everybody's personal car ought to be a bus route. God didn't give you a car just so you could use it for yourself. Amen. And I always felt bad as a pastor when I came to church. I didn't have somebody in my car with me. That means I wasn't out working. I wasn't out trying to lead somebody to Christ. I wasn't out trying to get somebody to church. Amen. You know, it's the Lord's work. It doesn't happen by osmosis. 3,000 were saved on the day of Pentecost from the Holy Spirit, but those guys had to preach, they had to pray, and had to preach. Amen? And everywhere you find people getting baptized, you find somebody going out and doing the work. And that's what we need to, that's what we need to do. And I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just telling you, I'm burning, desire in my heart to see the kind of church here that God wants us to be. You know what pastor said to me? He said, Brother Houston, I just want to see these people to see what I've seen. And that's what I want. I want people to see what I've seen. I want people to see the hand and working of God when souls are being saved, people are getting baptized, and the church is growing and going forward. Amen. I don't care if it's 2016. God is not dead. He hadn't changed. Amen. And man may be harder, but God is bigger. Amen. And I believe that with all my heart. I am not, I am not, I am not, I am not going to give up on having, uh, having, being the kind of church that God wants our church to be. Amen. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 29. Paul here writing to the church at Corinth. He says, Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? This is a controversial verse right here. But Paul is dealing with the resurrection here. And he's talking about the resurrection, that people didn't believe in the resurrection. He said, but baptism pictures a resurrection. And so why would a person be baptized if there is no resurrection? And he's talking about baptism. In 1 Corinthians, he talks about who he baptized and who he didn't. And he said he didn't come to baptize, but he wasn't condemning baptism. He was simply saying, I'm just trying to get you to see that baptism has always been a part of our Christian faith, but we have ceased to see people get baptized. And that's why Dr. Gray used to push it. He said, well, you tell me all these people got saved, but how many people are you seeing baptized? Because you see what? We are not fulfilling the Great Commission if all we do is lead them to Christ. We, 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 just, we just drop right there. We stop right there. 
And that's not what our churches are supposed to be, amen. I'm, I'm just trying to help you here. You know, uh, a baptism, we got, uh, why get baptized? Why practice baptism as a believer and a religion if there's no resurrection? We learned that the believers in Corinth were puffed up over who baptized them. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and look with me. They were puffed up over who baptized them. Yeah, and, and, we're, and, and, and they were totally wrong, but that shouldn't be that we throw baptism away. Amen? Amen. And I tell you, scriptural baptism is immersion. Amen? Can I get an amen right there? I mean, it's not sprinkling. It's not pouring. It's immersion. The word baptism, baptism is the Greek word baptizo. It means to immerse or totally submerge or place on the water. That's the only thing that pictures the death, the burial, and resurrection. That's baptism, amen? And everybody knew that baptism was a testimony of Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Paulus, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? He says, what was your baptism of? Was it in the name of Paul? It was in the name of Jesus, amen? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, amen? That was their baptism, amen? But they were baptized. You understand that? These believers were baptized. Here, you can't become a member of a church until you've been saved and scripturally baptized. Those are the prerequisition for church membership, amen? That's the prerequisition. That's what the Bible teaches, Look at verse 14, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest I should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the house of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of wisdom, lest the cross of Christ should be none effect. The point here is that the believers at Corinth were baptized. They got puffed about who, uh, up about who baptized them, but baptism was not the main issue. Salvation was. However, baptism was taught and practiced, and it should be done today. And God is looking for churches where people are being born again. And God is looking for churches where people are being baptized. And if we're not doing that in our church, then that's really not pleasing to God. Amen. And I, I, I'm not trying to be mean. I love this place. I, I love you. But listen, I want to be a kind of church that God looks down and says, hey, that's what I, I see in that church what I'm looking for. I'm looking for born again, people being born again. I'm looking for people being baptized. Number three, go back to Matthew 28 with me and verse 20. Uh, look what it says, teaching them to observe all things what's going to command you. Number three, number one, a place where people are being born again. Number two, a place where people are being baptized. Number three, a place where people are being built. A place where people are being built. Teaching them to observe all things what's going to commanded you. Now, can I tell you that a lot of our Baptist churches today are doing a good job with this? We've quit going out soul winning. We've quit bringing folks in. We've quit having baptism, but we're sure teaching a lot. And I'm for it. But I tell you what, that the Bible says that knowledge puffeth up. Amen. And if you and I are not going out and doing something and serving and working, all we are doing is becoming a bunch of pharisaical hypocrites. I know all this stuff, but I'm not, I'm not doing anything with it. It's like a guy with a Ph.D., you know, what does he do with it? You know, if I got a Ph.D. in, in, uh, in you know, in, in, uh, most Ph.D.s, I mean, most of them are just a piece of paper in my estimation. That's just what they are. Some of them are practical and some of them are used, but a lot of them are just some, something on the board so I can say, look, I know all this stuff. Well, so what? I'm not, imp I'm not impressed with what you know as a person. I'm impressed with what you do. Amen? You know, I've always based people on, on their actions and their character, not what they know or not the color of their skin. Amen? Amen. That's right. Amen. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 15. 2 Thessalonians 2, 15. Keep your finger there. Matthew 28. We'll be back. I'm almost done. I'm going to get you out of here early tonight. Maybe. I am. I am. I, I, I think I, I'm on track for early tonight. <laughs> 2 Thessalonians 2, 15. Look what it says. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught whether by word or epistle. Notice the word taught. 
Nobody has traditions. Nobody has positions except somebody taught them to them. Amen? And a part of the job of the church is to teach people the right positions. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. Go to First Peter chapter 5. Go to First Peter chapter 5. You know, we need to be having teaching ministries all over this place. Amen? And I, 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 Sunday morning, Sunday school, Sunday morning service, Sunday night service, Wednesday night service. And again, I'm more of a preacher than a teacher. And, 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 and that's just the way I am. But I tell you what, I, I think Pastor Holman was a great teacher, and he imparted a lot to us. I felt like Brother Howard's messages were really very well put together, chucked full of good stuff. I mean, I felt fed very well and also preached to very well. And, and, and we need teaching, amen? And, 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 and our church needs to be a place where people are being built. Hey, listen. If you and I are no better and have moved no forward, more forward in our Christian life today than we did a year ago, something's wrong. If I'm still where I used to be, doing the things I used to do, and having the, the knowledge I used to have, and I haven't increased in my behavior and my, my wisdom and understanding, then I am not being built And I want to go to a church where what the preacher gives me and what the Sunday school teacher gives me causes me to grow. And that growth is going to be seen by my actions. Amen. And my actions are no better than my growth hasn't appeared. Amen. I mean, I got my granddaughter here tonight. She's crawling. She used to just lay on her stomach and do nothing. Amen. But cry and lift her head. And then she started scooting along, pulling herself, and now she's up on all four, you know, and she's moving like crazy, pulling herself up and walking around the furniture. That means that she is growing. She is progressing. Look, if I look at somebody as a pastor and I look that they are doing absolutely no more than they did a year ago, then something is wrong. If their attitudes and their actions and their affections have not changed, then they are not growing. And this, is, this needs to be a church where we see people grow. And you know, I want to give God the glory and praise. But, I mean, I took people. My ministry was to the, uh, was to the inner city housing authority. Majority of my pe- people were black people. Majority of them had, had, had messes in their life like you wouldn't believe. Majority of those women ha- didn't have a husband and had children by several different men. Their lives were a mess. But I could take you today and show you some ladies that have some Christian character and some Christian modesty and are raising their children for God because they had a church where they could hear the truth and they grew. And I give God the glory and my workers uh, mo- most of the praise. But I'm glad as a part of church where people's lives were being built and we're not seeing people's lives being built then we need to ask God to help us to become that kind of a church where people are being built look at first Peter chapter 5 and verse 1 the elders which are among you I exhort whom also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also of taking the glory that shall be revealed feed the flock of God which is among you feed them go to first Corinthians chapter 3 verse 1 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1 with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1. And I got these in my notes. That's why I'm not turning, amen. That's why I can get ahead of you. But 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1. Look what it says. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able What an indictment against a church that is just full of babies. Carnal. Carnal means worldly. It means that they they won't accept sound doctrine. It means that they're living like the world, looking like the world, talking like the world, and there's no growth in them, spiritual growth. There's no change in their life. And Paul said, I have to feed you with milk because you can't handle the meat. And it's okay to feed a baby milk, but at some point, uh, my granddaughter is, is, is now eating real food. Amen? And that's a sign of growth. I'd hate to see her at, six, at 16 years of age still eating baby food. Amen? But there are a lot of Christians that are still eating baby food, and they've been saved for 20 years, and, and that's either a problem with the church is not teaching or they're not getting it. Amen? And then I, 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 when I pastored a church, I used to say to my folks, look, I don't want an evangelistic church. I want a soul-winning church. What's the difference, Brother Houston? Evangelistic church is when you pe- people bring people to the church and they expect the preacher to preach them down the aisle. That means you have to preach the gospel every Sunday morning. 
<laughs> but if you lead them to Christ and bring them here, then see, I've got a bunch of folks that only, uh, in my church, in this church, you, a bunch of folks that only come on Sunday morning. All you do is preach the gospel. The only thing they know is salvation. Paul said leaving the principles of the doc doctrine of the gospel of Christ and, and baptism. Let us go on. So I said to my folks, look, I don't want you to bring them here so I can lead them. You lead them to Christ because I need to feed my people. Those folks that only come on Sunday morning need to understand that they need to grow and they need to start getting here Sunday night and they need to grow and they need to start getting here Wednesday night. And there's a whole lot in that book about growing in there. I need to feed them, but I can't feed them if all the time i got to be preaching the gospel. Amen. As a boy growing up, it seemed like every Sunday all I heard was the gospel. Not all I heard was the gospel. I mean, hallelujah, but, but you know, look. Uh, when, when, when the majority of everybody's there saved, they don't need to hear the gospel. They need to hear it growing. Amen. And so, and so that's why our church needs to be a place where people are being born again. It needs to be a place where people are being baptized. And there needs to be a place where they're being built, built which means that you may have to stay after these people. You know, I used to tell my folks, don't give me your babies. Lead somebody to Christ and say, here, preacher, no. Look, if I led somebody to Christ, I'm going to minister to that person. I'm going to get, tell them, look, I need, you need to follow the Lord in baptism. You need to be in church. I'm going to go pick them up. I'm going to bring them. There are folks that I visit for uh, every Saturday for years. Years. My wife will contest, I, I can, can, will contest to that statement. I visited them every Saturday for years to keep them in church. So they could grow. Well, that's just a lot of work. Yeah, babies are a lot of work. And you have to stay at it until they learn to walk and talk on their own. Hey, Amen. And this, it's the Lord's work. Folks, I'm, not trying, I'm just trying to tell you that we have, we have settled in, in in this generation, and I'm a part of it. We have settled in that, you know, I get saved and that's it. And I just come and get, get, get. No, if you're saved, you're supposed to give, give, give. Amen. You're supposed to work and labor. You're supposed to be a part of reaching. My, my life's verse, Proverbs eleven thirty: the tree of righteousness is a fruit of uh, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that wins souls is wise. When you get saved, you're supposed to be fruitful. The fruit of a tree is reproducing, producing another tree. The fruit of a human is producing another human. The fruit of an animal is producing another animal. And the fruit of the Christian is producing another Christian. And that's what Jesus is saying. You've got to win them to Christ. You've got to baptize them. And then you've got to teach them to observe everything I do. So you need to make them to become like you. Actually, they become better than you. Amen. Amen. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. Paul writing to Timothy, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Watch verse 2 now. And the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Listen, we ought to be having teachers in this church. We ought to be having men and women in this church that have grown to the place of knowing their Bible enough that they can teach others also. Amen. That's what it's supposed to be. Go with me to, uh, go with it, with me to me, if you would, to, uh, um, let's go to Titus chapter 2. I'll leave out some of these other passages because I want to get you out of here early tonight. I want to beat the snowstorm. Amen. It's not coming. It's not coming. If it comes... I'll, I'll, I'll confess to being a liar. Amen. Titus chapter 2 and, and verse 3. Look what it says. The aged women likewise, that they in behavior as become in holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober. That means to be serious-minded. You know, um, teenage girls are giddy. Right? <laughs> That's okay, but sometimes they got to start getting sober, amen? Now, you can't be a mama and go, <laughs> all the time, you know? Pretty serious to be a mama, amen? Pretty serious to be a, a wife, amen? That they may be sober, to love their husbands. Well, who wouldn't love a husband? <laughs> you know, I mean, who wouldn't love somebody that is, is, is socks smell, amen, and throws them on the floor instead of the hamper, amen? Who wouldn't love that guy? Who would love some guy that, you know, he, he doesn't have enough sense to, 
to brush his teeth before he comes to give you a kiss, amen, or shave, or, you know, or who, who wouldn't love some guy that, uh, that doesn't have enough sense to know that, you know that wife needs to hear a kind words and soft things and doesn't need to be hearing these gruff old words from this gruff old man, you know. Uh, so it, uh, you know, these gals need somebody. We need a lady teaching some ladies how to be uh, sober and to love their husbands and to love their children. Well, all women love their children. Yeah, but I know some women that like to kill their children. I mean, there's just times, you know, and it, you know when it's happening, fellas, here's how it happens. Your son. When you hear the word your son, you know she's not in a loving mood right there. Well, what do you want me to do? <laughs> okay, son, put the, put the belt around your neck and start pulling, amen? No, son, you're still breathing. You're not doing it tight enough, amen? No. Hey, look, to love their husbands, to teach. I'm trying to get you to see the teach, to be discreet. To be discreet, boy, more than ever, because we have we have failed in our homes to treat young ladies how to be appropriate. We have to spend time, especially the kind of people that I was dealing with. You had to take those young. My wife taught those teenage girls. She had to take those teenage girls and try to teach them how to be ladies, how to behave themselves, how to be discreet around these boys. And you know that's that's a whole society that that's that's a mess over there. But their only hope is Jesus Christ and then learning that there's a better way of doing things. And if the church doesn't do that for them, I promise you the school's not going to do it for them. Promise you. Not because schools couldn't, but because schools have a philosophy and change and so that they don't. Because of political correctness and all that other junk and humanism, the schools have gone away from teaching what needs to be taught. If the church doesn't do that, how are we going to get done? To teach them to be chaste. That means to keep themselves pure. I spend a lot of time telling our, our ladies and telling our young ladies and preaching to them and having it brought to, to them that you need to keep yourself pure until you get to that marriage altar. That's God's plan. Amen. Keepers at home. Now, you can take that to whatever degree you want to. I'll tell you this. Uh, I think a mother's place should really be raising her children. That's what I think. I'm not criticizing anybody. But I do know this, that she ought to be a housekeeper. <laughs> I mean, man, no guy wants to live in a pigsty. Amen. Learn how to keep house, you know. And I'm not criticizing. Maybe you're not very good housekeeper, but just learn it. And it's good to have somebody help you and teach you. Amen. And then uh, that they be obedient, they be good and obedient to their own husbands. Why should a woman do all these things? Look at it, that the word of God be not blasphemed. You're a Christian? Well, if you're a Christian, you know, the only Bible some people ever read is your life. The only witness they'll ever get is what they see in you. They know you're a Christian. They hear you talk. They watch the way you behave. They, they, they have interaction with you. And they say, well, look, if that's Christianity, amen. We need to have a place where people are built. And then back to Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. And I'll get done tonight. A place where people are born again. A place where people are baptized. A place where people are being busy. And number four, a place where, be, where uh, I mean, excuse me, where people are, are being built. And then number four, a place where people are being busy. Look at verse 19. What's the first word? Go. Ye therefore. And what's the next word? Teach all nations. And what's the next word? baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Verse 20, what's the first word? Teaching. You know what all those are? All of those are imperative action commands. Go. Teach. Baptize. Teach. You know what that sounds like to me? Being busy. <laughs> Amen? Being busy. God is looking for a place where, where, where people are being busy. They're being busy. Notice he says, to the end of the world. Those apostles and other disciples were not going to live till the end of the world. So he's saying to them, listen, here's my commandment. To the end of the world, go, baptize, teach, teach. Go, baptize, teach, teach. And I'm going to be with you till the end of the world. And so generation to generation to generation has to take upon it the responsibility of being the busy ones. 
Our church should be a place of being busy about the master's business. Jesus was sitting in the temple at 12 years of age, and his mother and Joseph came and said, uh, uh, did you not know uh, uh, that your father and I were worried? And he said, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Jesus said, I must work the work of him that sent me while his day for the night cometh when no man can work. The Bible tells us to redeem the time. Redeem the time. It's not talking about you and I purchasing back the time for our personal desires. I need to save my time for my, for, for my, for my pleasure. No, God's talking about you and I making sure that we pay, that we purchase the time to be used in the Lord's work. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 very quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 very quickly. And look at me at verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. You're not there. You let me wait. I'm waiting. I'm really trying to get you out here early so I could say it and lie. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 1, verses 1 through 2. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God to Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth. To them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. I read that so you could understand that 1 Corinthians is, is written to the saints, the whole church. Now look at me in chapter 15. Go to chapter 15 if you would. And look at the very last verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And look at the very last verse. 58, Corinthians 15, 58. This verse is a very important verse to me. It has a very special point in my life, but I'll not give you the testimony tonight. But look what it says. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable. What's the next word? Always what? In what? That's for the Christian. That's to the believer. Not to the preacher. My beloved brethren, all you Christians... Be always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always. Always. Pretty powerful word. It sounds like God wants me to be working all the time. Yeah, I think he does. We're there for you to drink. What shall we do? Do all to the glory of God? I mean, I should always at least be doing, trying to do all I can for the cause of Christ. Amen. Not trying to save my life, but lose my life. I wrote a tweet this week. We're not supposed to seek love. We're supposed to love. We're not supposed to be served. We're supposed to serve. We're not supposed to save our life. We're supposed to lose our life. Those are biblical principles. We live totally opposite that. I don't want to do any more than I have to. You know what that word abounding there means? Study it. It means to superabound. You know what it means? It means to do more than is expected or enough. In other words, don't just get by. Be the extra mile Christian. Be willing to put out more effort, not less effort. Amen. Look what he says and goes on. You know, always abounding work of the Lord for as much as you know that what? Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Colossians 4, 5 through 6, walk in wisdom toward them without redeeming the time. Verse 6 says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. He says, you know what, you need to be redeeming the time, and you need to make sure that you're using your mouth to answer people. What are you going to answer men about? What they're questioning you about. What are they going to be questioning you about as a Christian? How about what you believe? What the Bible says, how about what you say? We should be redeeming the time, being always using the time for that which is eternal and important. Listen, I, I'm just saying, this is what God is looking for in a church, a place where people are being born again, a place where people are being, where people are being baptized, a place where, where people are being built, and a place where people are being busy. That's what God's looking for in a church. That's the kind of church I want to have. Which that means then I'm going to have to do something. I'm going to have to make sure people hear the gospel. I'm going to have to make sure that people hear the gospel understand they need to get baptized. And I may have to bring them here so they can get baptized. And then I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to understand that people that, that are babies need to have somebody carry them to church because they're not going to get here on their own. 
And so he's going to have to change their diaper for a while and burp them for a while and clean up their messes for a while and put up. And the Bible says, ye that are, that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. And God says you're going to have some people in your, in your church that are, are the weaker ones and some are the stronger ones. And you as the stronger ones have to understand that you're just going to have to have some patience. You're going to have to work with them. Amen. And then I just want to be, I want to be in a place where God's people are busy about the Lord's work. I want to say this as testimony, and I need to quit, but 26 years of pastor, and I had some dear folks that were at, at the church every Saturday morning, every year out, soul winning, running bus routes. I had people there every Sunday morning for 26 years that taught their Sunday school class, that drove the bus, that, 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 that worked on the bus. I had, people there every, uh, I had people there every Wednesday night who went out and knocked doors to tell people about Jesus Christ. I had some people who were hard-working, busy people. And I'm going to tell you that God blessed it. God blesses labor. Your labor is not in vain. Not your lethargy. God blesses labor. I want to be busy, and I'm not as busy I ought to be. I'm, I'm not so much conviction. I've been under so much conviction for months. I've been using all this physical stuff as an excuse. And because it's a little bit of a drive from Rose Hill to Wichita, that gives me an excuse. No, it doesn't. Truth of the matter is, this preacher tonight, I need to get busy for the Lord. Father in heaven.